Odegar, Odegar, golazo. Is Arsecast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James! That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's the best use of a Barry Manilow song I can possibly imagine. Yeah. Well, it, it had to be done. Had to be done. What can I tell you? <laughs> I uh, mean, he is, the, he is the worst. Oh my God! He's just. He really is. And look, we maybe have to take some responsibility for what happened yesterday yeah, because, yeah, you know, yeah. you rightly pointed out that, uh, you know, just after I tweeted that I hoped someone dropped an anvil on Lamella's head, he scored. And then, to be fair, you also said when Son was going off, that's a positive for us or whatever, yeah, something along boost. those lines. A boost. Yeah. So, look, we hold our hands up. We hold our we hands up. We were playing up. the long game. That's it. People don't realise, do they? Exactly. Exactly. We knew it was 4D chess, as they say. <laughs> so you're feeling good this morning, I take it. Everyone's feeling good, goodly, goodlier, goodliest, all of that, yeah. I guess. What a- Fantastic. I mean, listen, yeah. we won the derby. It's mm. a big thing. And, you know, we, we deserve to win it as well. We played really well for the vast majority of the game. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, you know, not mentioning the, the final period in which was slightly terrifying. But uh, yeah, I feel great. And listen, beating Tottenham always feels good. Beating a Jose Mourinho-led Tottenham, I think, feels extra special. Yeah, you know, and look, Tottenham are Tottenham and we all know how we feel about them. But there is a sort of, you know, there's a litany of cons there. You know, from Mourinho to Lamella to Kane to Deli Ali who's kind of a peripheral cunt at this point, but still, when he's on the pitch, you kind of remember. So it does oh, feel yeah. good. You've all these extra layers uh, to to um, to sort of boost how you're feeling uh, when you win a game like that. But, you know, I don't know where we start with this. I mean, I suppose we have to start with the, the team and the big mm-hmm. team news uh, mm-hmm. that, that came out beforehand. Yes, uh, that Cedric started. Yes, that was it. What is that click clickening noise? Is that... Are you doing uh, something? Yeah, maybe. Is it that? Ah, okay. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Um, what Carry did you on. just say? What did team you say? Oh, team news. Oh, yeah, Cedric. Yeah, that was the big one. Um, and of course, the small issue, minor issue of the captain uh, being unceremoniously dropped from the mm. starting lineup because. Well, it turns out it was he was late to the team meetup and and what have you. This is quite interesting, actually, because my initial reaction was, I don't, I didn't really understand why Mikel Arteta had made it public that it was a disciplinary issue because the only people who need to learn from disciplinary issues are his team, you know, his yes. players. The whole world, he doesn't need to set an example to the whole world. So I was a bit confused by it. It's a big, big decision as well. It really is. I know Lacazette is an experienced player, but Aubameyang's a captain. He's our best goal scorer, our best striker. We're going into a derby. You mm-hmm. know, it's a big, big decision that he made. Um, I suppose in the, the cold light of day, my feeling is I'm still a little confused as to why he made it public, but I imagine he took a calculated risk in in fronting up to it, making it a thing, drawing a line under it and hoping that we won so he could just quickly move on from it because it probably would have come out one way or another anyway. And then he gets accused of, you know, um, hiding the facts from everyone. So it's a bit of a no-win situation. Um, What were your thoughts? 
I, I was similarly quite surprised that he made that public. You know, these things do happen in football clubs and it's usually excused with an injury or the players being rested. I wonder if maybe he just didn't want to be the manager who didn't pick a Bemiang for the derby mm. of his own volition. You know, I, I mean, it was a, a glaring omission and maybe he felt the need to explain that it wasn't in his hands as he saw it. Ultimately, it is in his hands. He makes yeah. the decisions. But uh, yeah, it, it was interesting to go public with it. Um, and a big call, like you say. And if you make a call like that, you have to know it's going to come back to bite you if you don't win. I mean, yeah. had Arsenal not won this game, I'm sure that would have been levelled at Mikel Arteta by a lot of people as a piece of criticism, you know, that he'd taken this decision. For sure. For sure. Um, it's but having brave. won it... It's brave. You know, if, if that's what your standards are, it is a brave decision because, like you say, had we not won that game, people would be pointing to... Aubameyang's absence from the start is a key factor in it, you know? But he has this streak to him, Arteta. I mean, mm. let's not forget, he picked an FA Cup final team that had Matt Smith on the bench instead of Mesut Ozil, Matej mm. Guendouzi. You know, he he is prepared to take a stand on these things. And clearly it's really important to him. I think there was a quote from him in one of his interview, TV interviews last night about saying, you know, it's almost as important as, you know, the results and what we do on the pitch. You know, we can't get where we want to go without establishing some of these cultural yeah. uh, rules, essentially. Um, yeah, it was a really, really big call and credit to him. It, it paid off. He comes out of it looking very strong. His authority grows um, and, mm -hmm. you know, presumably all will be well and Aubameyang he said Aubameyang is available for selection for the next game and maybe he's learned his lesson I mean it's a you know it seems like a very meagre thing to leave someone out for doesn't it being late but if it's not somebody's first offence well that's and maybe it. if if they're the captain as well and expected to set a particular example accordingly, yeah. it becomes all the more important that you do do something. Yeah, I mean, look, I can't imagine that on the, the day of a North London derby, if Aubameyang had turned up late, you know, perhaps it was out of his hands. You know, there, there was a tweet going around, wasn't there, with him stuck in traffic somewhere. Um, yeah, I saw him. Yeah, I know I you, you tweeted that as well. Yeah, so, you know, if I think any manager would say, OK, look, there was a traffic jam or there was an accident or whatever it was, you know, we have these standards, but don't do it again. I don't think it would, you're getting left out if that's the first time that's yeah. happened to you. And it was just like, sorry, there was nothing I could do. I was stuck in traffic. You know, I called, I let you know I was on the way, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I think you guys in The Athletic reported that it is not the first time that it's happened. So maybe he just felt, you know, it's one time too many. Yeah, he missed a COVID test earlier this year as well. You know, there have been a couple of other slightly lax sort of breaches of protocol. Um, and, and also, I think this is a slightly tricky one because I think the club were absolutely right to give him as much time off as they did for him to deal with the situation with mm. his mother being unwell. But I, I suspect, you know, in Mikel Arteta's thoughts is, you know, we have, um, how can I put it? We have kind of done everything we can to help you in that situation. And so the least that you can do is abide by our rules. And mm. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's kind of a reasonable enough position. Um, yeah. Do you think, I mean, be, uh, we should draw a line under this quickly as well, because it's not the, the main talking point at all. But do you think, or do you have any concerns that it might have repercussions? Or is this one of those things that like, okay, he's going to be unhappy about not taking part in a North London derby, and particularly one that we've we've won, you know, mm -hmm. to miss out mm -hmm. on that enjoyment, you know, is, is going to be a painful thing for him. But do you expect it to, you know, for him to sulk or anything like that? Or is this going to be something that's, you know, um, we move on from quickly? Yeah, I hope and think the latter. I mean, you know, we reported this morning that he left immediately after the game and didn't take part in the the warm down. Um, I, I don't know if that was with the manager's permission or not. I right. don't know if those or, you know, I don't know if those warm downs are um, voluntary or if they're obligatory. Yeah, yeah. But he, he very clearly made an immediate exit after the game, um, which I think, you know, some people can will probably interpret that as a rift. I don't. I see that as a guy who loves to be part of the party, loves to be part of the big games, mm. loves to be on the field scoring goals. He's probably incredibly disappointed, gutted even, I would say, yeah. to miss out. Um, that would be my in interpretation of right. those events. 
Well, look, Ty, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope, like you, it'll be something that everyone moves past really quickly because there's a lot still to play for this season, as yesterday's result uh, demonstrated and illustrated. And, you know, it didn't do much for our position in the league table, but three big points. And, you know, everything's quite tight in that area of the, the Premier League table and, of course, the Europa League. So, you know, your responsibility is to the club, to the teammates. You know, you are the captain accept it, move on. You don't have to like it, but, you know, maybe show your anger or frustration on the pitch next time you play and take it out on the opposition. That's the best way to do it. So, I um, hope so. Yeah. I hope so. And and uh, just a quick thing on Aubameyang, by the way. Did you feel that the decision not to bring him on was part of the, the disciplinary thing? Do you think had he, I, if it was down to purely tactics, do you think he would have come on? I was I was looking for him to come on. I think I said on the live blog, well, get Aubameyang on just before we yeah. got the penalty. Um, and you used to get him on at half time, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think, you know, listen, Lacazette scored the penalty brilliantly. It was a really great penalty, no question about it. But mm. I thought he had a stinker of a first half. And I'm sure Mikel Arteta must have been a little bit worried, you know, about the decision that he made. He's put, put Lacazette in. And he didn't make the most of a couple of really good uh, occasions in front of goal. You know, there were maybe three I can think of. There was one where Smith Rowe set him up brilliantly and he shanked his shot. There was another one where he stepped over it for some reason. The sensational dummy for yeah. Cedric 50 Cedric. yards behind him. I, I thought that was uh, incredible yeah. vision on the part of Lacazette. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Listen, I don't and think there was, he had there was another a one as well. good game. Yeah, there was another one. I think Saka put in a cross and, and he was just caught on his heels, uh, put in a cross where, where he should have probably got there ahead of the, um, maybe he did get there ahead of the defender, but he didn't move in time. So he didn't have a good game, I, I thought. So I was looking for him to come on. As the game went on, Pepe for Saka was a substitution, wasn't it? Then, mm-hmm. then there was, what was the other one? Uh, I, I don't know. And Elneny was the final one, right? Elneny was the last one. Yeah, Willian for Smith Rowe. Yes, um, yes, yes. I suppose you could make a case that all of those were, were tactical rather than any kind of punishment. Like Willian right. for Smith Rowe didn't work, wasn't a good change, it didn't help us in any way, but you could probably see why he chose to make that change. Mm. Um yeah, yeah. I just thought, I just wondered, you know, uh, because personally, looking at the game, I was thinking we've got to get Aubameyang on here for this last. Yeah, minutes. me too. I mean, maybe El Neni for. I mean, that's a, like what we have. We hold substitution. You take your striker off and you put El Neni on to sort of run around and mm-hmm. and press and and what have you. I mean, I'm pretty sure Aubameyang could have done that if you know yeah. he'd been asked to. So maybe I don't know. But look, let's let's leave that particular situation to one side and talk yeah. about what was a really good performance from from Arsenal in the first half in particular I think the um, the way we played some of the chances we created Smith Rowe I thought was excellent on the left hand mm-hmm. side I thought Martin Odegaard was excellent as well um, very excited Kieran by Tierney, yeah thought. Kieran Tierney you know roasted Matt Doherty um, uh, down the down the left hand side uh, quite often, which was good. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we should have been ahead. We had chances. We hit the bar. We hit, hit the post. There was the Lacazette, um, you know, chance that he missed. Um, I mean, they really did take Doherty apart down that left, didn't they? Smith Rowe and and Tierney in particular. The combinations were were fantastic. Yeah, and speaking to a few Spurs fans, actually, they were surprised he started this game, Doherty. I think a lot right. of people thought Serge Aurier might play just to kind of cope with Arsenal's athleticism and running power on that flank um, in Tierney. Doherty didn't have a good game at all. We really made him look very ordinary on that side. And I think mm. a lot of the credit for that's got to go to to Smith Rowe and Tierney, who, who dovetailed really, really well. I mean, uh, Smith Rowe, you know, we, he came into the team as number 10. And that's his preferred position. I happen to think he can he can really do this job from the left hand side mm. as well. I think it actually suits him, to be honest, to a certain extent. And I think having him and Odegaard in the same team just allows us mm. more options, more variety, more creativity. I thought he was excellent. I mean, it is a big demonstration of Mikel Arteta's faith in him, isn't it? That he's starting him in a game like this because he only came back from injury uh, during the week, didn't he? He got a few minutes against Olympiacos. Um, You know... I think it is. And and it also makes me think, you know, we've been sort of kind of pondering 
about Willian starting on that left-hand side. And I do wonder, is it partly because he's kind of the best proxy for Smith Rowe? I mean, when Smith Rowe's mm. been fit, he's played out there, you know, in, yeah. in recent times. Yeah, I mean, look, he's he's only really established himself in, in the team under Mikel Arteta since the Chelsea game, which was December yeah. 26th. And now when you're starting in a North London derby, it, it, it highlights how important you are or how important the manager sees you. You know, there's there's a lot of potential, isn't there? I know Odegaard is not our player, and I think I've got a question or two about that for part two, so we'll hang on to that. But, you know, that kind of setup behind a striker is, mm. you, you can see how you could make real progress with that. As Definitely. a team, you know what I mean? Definitely. And I think what Tierney did, uh, sorry, what Smith Rowe did really brilliantly as well was he allowed um, Tierney to, to overlap and that combination was really effective. Mm. I, I do think there is something happening in this team. It is tricky, you know, because like you say, you look at the league table, you're elated after that win and yeah. then you look at the league table and you sort of go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, I, you know, I, I'm quite big on this idea that maybe, maybe the league table does lie at the moment I do feel like we're slightly better than we're showing <laughs> when it suits us I guess it, it does yeah it does, exactly yeah <laughs> but Tottenham are above us yeah yeah but look does. that's that's the part it's of it's been lying for fan. years yeah 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 it's been really since wrong since 2004 as far as I'm aware <laughs> Yes, yes, I agree with you 100%. Um, so look, we're we're playing well and then they score what's clearly, you know, a fluke of a goal um, from Lamella. Yeah, he trips over his own feet, doesn't yeah. he, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely sickening, I have to say. Um, just being there, that was, I was directly in line behind it. I sort of saw the execution, saw it go through party's legs, mm. knew the player it was as well. I mean, mm. Lamella, from the minute he came on, I think the first thing he did, and to an extent, who can blame any Premier League footballer for doing this? But I think the first thing he did was go over and sort of have a go at Granite Xhaka and think, you know, can I wind this guy up? He did can have a, booked? yeah, but yeah, he had a kick at, was it Partey as well? He yeah, left Tierney a- was, uh, he was involved with Tierney as well pretty early I mean he's just a prick there's no two ways about it he's a snide prick and for that reason alone I will not give him any credit whatsoever for the goal (laughs) none yeah I I was just uh, on uh, Mark Chapman's podcast this morning Mm. and I was uh, saying do you think Spurs will release a DVD just of the goal (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that one minute of the game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Very possibly. But yeah, listen, we don't have to give it any credit whatsoever. From an Arsenal perspective, any complaints? I maybe wonder if we could have closed down the cross field ball from Bale a bit quicker. Um, mm. It's opportunistic, you know, and sometimes it's really difficult to... I mean, it's not like we made a big, big error, you know, like in the previous no. games so you know no. that was another relatively pleasing part of uh, of yesterday is that there was no glaring error there were a couple of iffy tackles laid on in those final 10 minutes which provided them with some dangerous situations which we might not have looked on quite as kindly um, had something else happened but you know there wasn't the big big error the big cl- uh, clangor that, that um, you know has haunted us and, and caused us so many problems in the last few weeks and that was so- their first shot um, yeah, I remember. I saw. I remember seeing the stat come up, and it's like Arsenal six shots, Spurs one shot, one goal. It felt very fucking familiar and very Mourinho, and I didn't like it. I really, really, really didn't like it at all. Well, no, because it played into their well, their kind of game plan. I mean, Spurs fans enjoyably are up in arms about their performance in this game, and I do understand it because Mourinho picked. The lineup he's been picking recently, which is a pretty at- attack minded one, you know, he had Lucas Moura in behind Kane, Bale and Son on either side. Um, you know, he had Ndombele playing as a deep midfielder rather than as the most advanced. It was a team that mm. said they come here to attack and to go for it, and they just didn't really do that until it was, the final 10 minutes. It was mental, it was like somebody um flicked a switch on Lucas Moura and said, Hey, you're good at football. You should, you yeah. know, do things with the ball. Do you know you're Brazilian? 
Oh, oh wow, fuck! I've probably got some skills here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, um, it, it, yeah. But I, they, you know, for the personnel they had, they and given you know some of our vulnerabilities and our you know the mistakes we do tend to make at the back. They weren't able to mount any pressure on us whatsoever they, in that yeah, first they, 70 minutes. They didn't, though, did they? I mean, there were moments where we had the ball at the back and we were playing it around, Louise mm-hmm. and Gabrielle, and you're looking, you know, they're obviously staying um, within the, the, the confines of whatever structure Mourinho had put on them, but there were moments where I was thinking, you know what, if they just pushed forward a little bit and pressed us, you know, they could probably... Uh, exploit that little weakness we've had, yeah. but they didn't. Um, and obviously no. they wanted to keep things compact. Um, it was quite telling how we were looking for the long ball um, behind so often early on. Um, it mm. worked a few times. There were a couple of really great passes. I think one from yeah. David Luiz. Yeah, uh, I spoke to um, Rafa Honigstein. He was at the game doing Sky Germany and he said to me, I can't get over Spurs the way they play. He said, they play a high line, but they don't press. Mm. And it was a really weird passive performance for, I'm, I'm not at all trying to take credit away from Arsenal more just having a go at Jose Mourinho yeah quite right if that's alright with everyone that's fine I think that's fine so look <laughs> 1-0 and you're thinking okay we've been here before and I was uh, very much of the opinion that the one thing we had to do was make sure we didn't concede a second goal like we did in the, the game earlier in the season where we conceded not long before half time and I was thinking okay well look just just get to half time don't concede yeah. a goal just before halftime because that's been a bit of a, a feature of our, our season, you know, letting goals in not long before the break, whether it's a concentration thing or whatever it might be. But to do the other thing and actually score a goal um, was very pleasant. I enjoyed it a lot. I think we should do that more, to be That'd be nice, quite honest. It? Yeah. Um, and, uh, good goal, too. Let's hope the world never gets wise to... Uh, Kieran Tierney's stop and go trick. I think it is just very difficult to prevent him doing it. He is exceptional at that. You know, the way he kind of turns, turns his body, mm. st- stops completely dead, knocks it beyond the guy and goes again. Uh, Classic it's really, push really and run stuff, isn't it? You know, you don't, it's, it's, it's not particularly subtle. It feels quite old fashioned. You know, when you think about how skillful players make space for themselves, whether it's dribbling or whatever it might be, um, his is I'm not going to say industrial it's great and it's really effective but you know I think you're right that um, you know it, they know what he's going to do still can't stop him doing it so exactly there's no way they don't prepare for it and I guess the difference is you know someone like say Kolasinac he would knock it and run but his body shape always remained the same if you watch Kieran Tierney um, he's got, kind of got these snake hips and he, he he manages to really faint one way and move the other snake hips I like it yeah old snake hips old snake hips Tierney as snake they call hips. <laughs> that's his dressing room nickname <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I, I love it I love it and uh he did really well, not mm. only to get beyond the guy, but once he got there, his delivery was very deliberate, I mm. thought. Uh, it's a good pick out. He deliberately and, uh, didn't give the ball to Lacazette and <laughs> deliberately gave it to Martin. I'm Ligo. not making that mistake again, because it was just moments after the one Lacazette had stepped over, I think, which right. led to Cedric hitting the post. And Odegaard takes up a really good position. I mean, I have to be honest and say I didn't, I didn't really think this would be a facet of his game, this ability to mm. arrive around the penalty spot, I, but he's he's making a habit of it. I think it's new. It's certainly new. Mm-hmm. It's not something he he did. Well, then, no, I'm thinking about the, the Villa game. Remember the shot that he missed in the yeah. Villa game? So maybe it is, but yeah, to, to, to have a player like that arrive in the box and the timing of that, I mean, that is sort of what I think we said it the other day, didn't we? It's kind of what you would associate with Smith Rowe. You know, he's that mm-hmm. guy who arrives and who is in that in that position. But, you know, um, Odegaard finished a little deflection off uh, Alderweireld, but uh, ball's in the back of the net and it's 1-1 uh, just going into half time. Can I ask you, um, were you as irritated as I was by Martin Tyler not understanding the concept of two minutes? Oh, I you didn't, didn't see I was it. at the ground, so I, I, I was spared that experience. Right. So... They announced two minutes of of uh, time added on at the end of the half. And it's about one minute and 20 seconds into that. And we have a throw or a corner, I think, towards the end. And Martin Tyler was like, 
Well, the two minutes are up. Uh, Tottenham will be very <laughs> unhappy now if uh, if Arsenal get something from this. You know, I don't know what the referee's thinking here. He's well over the allotted two minutes of time. And it's like, did nobody just sort of give him a... Martin, Martin, it's like, it's two minutes. You just play with one. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand um, what was going on there. I found that quite That irritating. is bizarre. Mm, is I, I think that can only be... Compared to, uh, I think Martin Keown called a Rabona a Ribena uh, on Match of the Day 2 last night, which I enjoyed. But yeah, I, listen, it was fantastic to get the equaliser just before half time. And we yeah. had hit the woodwork twice. Yeah. I mean, I'm still gutted for Emil Smith Rowe about that shot. Yeah, yeah. Off the woodwork. Was a great, a, like, keeper was beating all ends up, wasn't he? A star making moment, really, for him. But. There you go. So, um, a substitution at half time. Pepe mm. for Saka, um, an injury worry. They said he felt something in his hamstring. So, um, I mean, that, that's an obvious change. Um, I mean, how do it's you. It's kind of like for like, isn't it? You know, on that right hand side, they do similar roles. And Pepe is playing mm. very well at the moment. I mean, if you, I think if you had to compare the two halves, I think Pepe had the better game than, yes. than Saka did. I think so. Saka was quite quiet and, again, took a, a fair bit of punishment, a few kicks and, and what have you. So, um, yeah, look, fingers crossed he's not out. But look, when you've got somebody with the quality of Pepe to replace Bakayo Saka, you're not doing too badly. Um, so what else did we do then in that... Um, in that second half, they took Bale off. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Much to the irritation of Spurs fans again, which I enjoyed. <laughs> How do you know so much about what Spurs fans are, are thinking? I look on Twitter. Oh, right. I, I look on Twitter <laughs> because I like seeing how angry they get with Mourinho. And it's right. it's really good fun. Do you just, I mean, have you got random people to follow or specific people? I follow or? some Spurs fans that I know, but right. also, you know, Jose out, Mourinho out. Those hashtags have been doing some good business in the last 24 hours. Okay, so 62 minutes uh, on the live blog. I say, get Aubameyang on. Second later, we get a penalty. Um, <laughs> Your jinxing powers were in full effect. Fucking yes. hell, magic, magic. So, what... Credit you, Nicola Pepe, by the way. I mean, so. that is a sensational pass. A sensational pass. I mean, I think it kind of summed up Lacazette's day in a way that he whiffed at that shot. You know, uh, yeah. it was a brilliant, brilliant ball from from Pepe, and not just a ball. I think he, I think he kind of pulls it out the sky. I think it's like an interception and then a pass immediately. I've not been able to confirm that because the TV cameras were actually showing a replay of something else. Um, but I think he, I think it's like a, a goal kick or a, a pass out towards the Tottenham left back. Maybe it's Reguilon, and he chases back, wins it, and gives it. It's a really good bit of play. Right, right, right. I'd have to. Are you you're saying we can't see it on the on the TV? I don't think the live broadcast had it. I think they were showing a replay of something else that had just happened. Maybe right. that cuz it had that shot on the spin. Uh I forget exactly what it was. Looking at it here. But let's have a look. Why not? You might, you might be able to confirm it. Oh yeah, he does actually. Yeah, they just cut to him and he intercepts it. And it's a first time. I mean, what a pass that is. That is yeah. unbelievable. So it's a bit of defensive play and a bit of creative play mm. rolled into one. Yeah, you know, and I think he has been unlucky not to be more involved of late Pepe. I oh, think yeah. he has, you know. So when he comes on and makes that kind of a contribution, I'm really glad to see it for him, obviously for us as well, um, because it shows, I guess, a, a level of determination to have an influence when he does get his chances. You know, Definitely. rather than somebody feeling sorry for themselves, like, and if he was feeling a little bit sorry for himself or a little bit unhappy that he hasn't been used, you, you wouldn't blame him too much. So, you know, to 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 have that impact yesterday was really very pleasing. Yeah, I mean, that was the narrative for his first eighteen months in the club. Maybe you know, has he been made to feel like he belongs? Does he feel important in the team? Has his confidence mm. been knocked by him not being selected? At the moment, his confidence doesn't seem to be knocked whether he plays or not. And when he's coming on, he's having a massive impact. Now, I mean, that's a bit of a mm. double-edged sword if you're Nicola Pepe. You don't want to become the impact guy. You don't want to become the last 20 minutes guy. But I have to credit him for the attitude that he is showing in what must be a frustrating period. Mm. You know, he's not doing a lot wrong. And yet equally, you look at Arteta's decision to start Smithrow and Saka yesterday. Yeah you know, you can understand why he made that call as well. So it's a tricky one. 
It is. I mean, I, I'm guessing he was asking Saka to push through and, and rest him for the Olympiacos game. Um, mm. So fingers crossed there isn't too much wrong with him because, you know... He was on the pitch at full time. He was walking right. with a slight hobble, but he seemed in very good spirits. Um, so I think if they were too concerned about him, I'm not sure they would have let him do that. Arteta said he was feeling something in his hamstring. So we'll see. I don't think he'll play against Olympiakos, given the lead we have in that game. And yeah. maybe the, that's fine and the rest will do him some good. Yep. So penalty and uh, like I said, as I said earlier, I think it was a really, really good penalty. Really well, good. Well, we've Big not discussed pressure. the decision yet, Andrew. Well, <laughs> what's to discuss? <laughs> what's to discuss? I watched well, Match of the Day 2 last night with astonishment. I just could not believe what Jermaine Genus was talking about. I saw him on Twitter say to somebody, you don't understand football because yeah. they had a go at him for the what, whatever it was he was saying about the penalty. Imagine. I, I mean, mean, the thing is, I, I obviously I found Jermaine Genus absolutely hilarious. I really, really... I don't, I don't watch Match of the Day that much, I must confess. Well, I haven't um, watched it much I, this season because we keep no. having shit results. So. Yeah, and we're probably always on last, right? Because we're bang in the middle of mid-table. Yeah. But um, on first I really last night? enjoyed it. Yeah, exactly. I really enjoyed match there too last night. With the penalty, I think it is a penalty. I do kind of understand that idea of Lacazette. It's Lacazette's shot that carries through into the contact. Do you see what I mean? Like, in the same way that I felt like David Luiz didn't make that challenge on the Wolves fella, mm. Lacazette basically kicks the Spurs defender as he comes across. So I, I, I can see why there's a debate about it. No, 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 not for me. Not for I mean, I, I from a logic based standpoint, perhaps. But I'm sitting here this morning with my Arsenal hat on, and no, I'm just. Oh, uh, if anybody asks you what I think, <laughs> I think it's a stonewall penalty. I yeah. think you should have been sent off. Uh, you know, but if I'm just kind of you know stepping out of myself, I can understand. But st- lots Step of Tottenham fans, Step you know these Tottenham fans yourself. who I'm always reading and yeah, listening yeah. and engaging with. A lot of them said. That's a penalty. That's getting given. Well, I mean, look, if we if we had seen David Luiz do that and a penalty was given, I don't think we'd be complaining really no, about we'd be the decision. We'd be he's complaining about and he's asking he's for trouble. He's done it again. He's out of control. He's hurtling through the box. I mean, it's a very Mustafi penalty to give away, if you like. Uh, you could yeah, certainly yeah. see him. You could certainly see him do. There was if, something. Um, Go on. If Lacazette makes good contact with the shot. Do you think it gets given? That's a good question. That's a good yeah. question. Like if he forces a save from the goalkeeper or or it's the post or something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe it well, was... Even if it just goes out of play, do you know what I mean? If it goes behind. Yeah. Because there seems to be a bit of a sort of free-for-all. If the striker gets his shot away, as far as I'm aware, you can shoot them, uh, you know, with a <laughs> rifle. I mean, it, it is an interesting sort of facet of the game, that. Yeah. I do wonder if he'd got good... I think it's one of those where whatever the referee gave... I'm not sure VAR would have overturned it. I think it's uh, it's one of those ones. Yeah, but I mean, look, we've seen, see we've it, seen yeah, we? of course, and we're overdue on them. We should have had one against Burnley last week, of course, uh, with Pepe. So we're due a decision. But uh, you know, you have to remember that this is a this is a season in which uh, did I see who was it? Was it Liverpool? I think it was Liverpool, where one of their defenders was kind of. Um, sliding in the box yes, and the guy yeah, ran yeah. into the back of him. He kneed the defender in the head and fell over and got a penalty. Like the Well, well then if that's a penalty, then ours is a, a thousand percent a, a penalty. Mega penalty. And let me tell you, I was sat just behind Jason Mourinho in the dugout. He had access to replays. He was going absolutely mental saying it wasn't a penalty. So for it to be upheld was a very satisfying Well, I moment. did enjoy his uh, post-game interview. I don't normally watch the opposition post-game interviews, but on this occasion, I I, I, I gave myself the uh, pleasure <laughs> the <treat>. of watching, <laughs> watching Mourinho uh, complain bitterly and saltily about how it was never a penalty and how Michael Oliver's... Um, decisions were astonishing like when it comes to penalties whether it was with Chelsea or or Man United and now Tottenham it was astonishing like his record of penalties he's such a good referee but he's you know blah 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 but you know look he can stick it up his arse to be perfectly well, honest um, even if it wasn't a penalty which I don't think I think it was but even if it hadn't been it's classic deflection from Mourinho because yeah. on the balance of play Tottenham did not really deserve anything at all from this game 
No, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. And I think, you know, in many ways, Michael Oliver was quite generous towards Tottenham yesterday with his um, reluctance to get the yellow card out um, mm. throughout the game. Now, I know that sounds weird because I had a man sent off and we'll laugh about that uh, now in a second. But, you know, there were moments where I thought um, they they were led away with a lot of stuff. I think there was a foul by uh, Hoiberg at one point and he called him over and he had that word with him. You know, that like, don't do it again, because otherwise, and then he did it again, and he didn't do anything. You know, there were a he number of fouls. A lot, he does. Yeah, well, I mean, as a team, I think they tend to get away with a Well, we'll get on to lot. Harry Kane. But, well, but, but yeah. by the way, just quickly, what a good penalty it was. Um, I, I have yeah. to be honest and say... I had my doubts. He's a very good penalty taker. He I is. shouldn't have doubted him. He is. Well, no, I mean, I, I understand why he had some doubts because he, he'd had a poor game. Yeah. Really. You know, credit to him for, for slotting that penalty away under a lot of pressure, but I think he had a, a poor game overall. So if a moment, you know, it can happen in a game where you think, well, that just sums up the bad day that Alexander Lacazette has had. He played really badly and then he missed a penalty, but he didn't. It was a really unsavable penalty. Even if Loris had gone the right way, there was yeah, no way really he was saving penalty. that. So, you know, credit where it's due uh, for the execution on that one. Um, speaking of execution, uh, that brings <laughs> us nicely to Eric Lamella. <laughs> I mean, the first... How Genus is claiming that's not sending off. I think that is a more, uh, the more clear sign of a pundit having a mental breakdown than the penalty thing. I mean... Unreal. Unreal. Yeah. I mean, he should have been booked well before that because he was involved with Xhaka. He was involved with um, uh, Partey. He had a little kick out off the ball at Partey. Uh, there was a foul on Smith Rowe early in the second half where basically Smith Rowe had burst past him on the left-hand side carrying the ball out of defence. And Lamella you know, did what that guy did to to Lacazette early in the first half. He basically hauled him down. It was a rugby tackle kind of thing. One of those where it's a very deliberate, very cynical foul. Again, mm. Michael Oliver chose not to issue a yellow card on, on either occasion. And, you know, it's just a bit strange. I know you, you say, well, look, there's got to be some kind of physical um, aspect to the game. But cynical fouls like that, where there's literally no attempt whatsoever to play the ball, are yellow cards. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he was looking not to have been booked before the first one. Maybe he got the ball for the first uh, challenge on Partey, but he came in from behind. So what's he expecting? Absolutely. And, you know, the second one, he's very stupid. He raises his arm to Tierney. Um, there's a good replay, actually, yeah. I've seen doing the round social media with Mourinho in the background. Have you seen that? One? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I think Mourinho's reaction is one of, oh, oh shit, I can't believe you've just done that. Yeah. Um, I think it's that and not sort of having a go at Tierney for falling to the ground. I think Mourinho, you could see, kind of knows exactly what Lamella has done and what it's going to cost him and Spurs. Yeah. Although, bizarrely enough, it kind of proved to be the catalyst for them getting back into the game. Oof, okay. I mean, we, we, we do have to talk about the final... 10 minutes then. Yeah, um, shame. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, on a scale of 1 to 100, where 1 is not scared at all and 100 is terrified out of your mind, where would you say you were during that period? What was your peak level of fear? Mm, high. When Harry Kane heads that ball in, oh. the split second before the offside flag goes up, you know, I'm in yeah. the 90s. Oh, right? my stomach flipped. Genuinely, my yeah. stomach flipped. Um, um, yeah, thank goodness uh, he was offside. Um, and, and he was very clearly offside. But yeah. I mean, it's such a weird one. You know, at 75 minutes or, or whatever it was, I, I was looking at Arsenal and thinking... This has been a masterclass in control in Harry mm. Kane. I mean, he's, the guy's not had a kick. And I still think that's true. I think Gabriel had a really good game, you know, up until I, that point. I thought he, Gabriel he, and Louise were, were very good. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and Gabriel particularly dominated Kane yeah. aerially, physically, um, in so, a way that not many Premier League centre-backs do. Yeah, so much so that, like, Kane took it out on him with the kind of foul... That, 100% that, that, that's what happened. 100% yeah. that's his frustration at not being in the game and Gabriel basically mastering him during the course of this match and how that's not attracted more attention. I mean, I say I enjoyed match of the day, 
they didn't show that once. No, you know? I, I had a, a message from, I'm just trying to find it here, um, from, boom, 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 from Sam Palerm, um, who's down under, and he was telling us that um, an AFL player did what Kane did to Gabrielle in preseason and got a one-match ban. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was really dangerous. It was reckless. It was uh, violent. It was frustrated. He could have caused him some serious injury because, you know, if his shoulder connects with Gabrielle's jaw or cheekbone or whatever it is, you know, he causes him a serious injury there. And I think the England captaincy thing is obviously part of it, but it's it's really terrible on the part of the media to completely overlook something like that because, and simply because, he is the England captain and a golden boy. I can guarantee you that if that was a different player, I'm not saying an Arsenal player uh, necessarily, but I can guarantee you that there are players in this league who, if they carried out that kind of foul, this would be shown time and time again. Or if, for example, that foul was perpetrated upon Harry Kane, you wouldn't hear the fucking end of it. So, you know, at this point in his career, having seen him do countless things which could cause serious injury to a player, I think he is really lucky. And the people involved in the incidents that he's been involved in are really lucky that nobody has been badly injured. And it's, you know, I'll say it's a matter of time, you know, before it happens. Maybe it won't ever happen. I hope it doesn't ever happen. But if it does, if it does happen, nobody can say that it's a shock or a surprise. No, and there clearly is kind of a a symbiotism, a relationship between the way the media react to these events and I think the punishments that are handed out for them. I mean, we saw that mm. ourselves. Who remembers Eduardo's dive? You know, that the, the media furore uh, around that issue, mm. I think, engendered the disciplinary action. And I think with Kane, there's a willingness, a desire almost to sweep some of these yeah. things on the carpet. It's nothing new. We all remember... Some of the stuff Alan Shearer got away with in his playing days. Yeah, yeah. Um, elbowing on people, stamping on people. Kicking Neil Lennon in the head. Yeah. I mean, All sorts of stuff. Didn't, um, uh, I mean, Harry Maguire got away with some something. Was it this season or last season where he booted someone in the balls and got away with it? Yeah. He got away with something in Greece as well. But, I, yeah, I, I think, <laughs> um, I think uh, it is a, a frustrating thing, certainly, mm. because... It's a really egregious foul on yeah. Gabriel yesterday and one that's purely a player who is frustrated. Yeah. That said, last 10 minutes, Oof. Spurs managed to Hit the get post. him into the game. Mm. Yeah, uh, they, you know, they start uh, doing better things in wide areas, crossing the ball better. Lucas Moura remembers he's Brazilian. Lucas Moura remembers, he finds his passport in his sock. <laughs> um, and Gabriel who, as I say, I thought had a very good game, makes a a vital, vital block. Unbelievable piece of defending that because when the the ball came back off the post, uh, do you have any issue with Bernd Leno for that? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I'd have to see it again. Let me have a look if I can find it now. Yeah. Do you then? Um, I do wonder, should he, I mean, if that ball was more accurate, I think it was going in. I don't think Leno would have got there. I could be wrong. I'd have to watch it back again myself. But I just, I remember yeah, thinking yeah. at the time I had a little bit of a worry about, about, um, about his positioning. Let me tell you this in, from within the ground. I don't know how to what extent this was clear on television. Arsenal were terrified. I think yeah. that they were really tense and you could see it in the interaction between players Mm. um there were not rows but you know very vocal disagreements there was one where shaka fouled someone on the edge of the box um and he turned and he was furious with uh, louise particularly i think and gabrielle as well for for dropping off and allowing spurs to come on to them um there was an incident where louise lost his rag with somebody about i think it was with thomas Partey, maybe of the concession yeah, of the yeah, foul. yeah a corner there was a party gave away a corner that's right I, I, and that was kind of mm. not so much on the sidelines but Oof. on the pitch yeah it was very palpable i mean you never got the sense that we had an extra man that's the weird thing about it. I mean, and, and look, it, it almost seems mad to say that we had the extra man. 
You know, it felt like we had one man less. Yeah, I'm looking at that again. I think Leno, I think we'd be critical of Leno had that gone in because he took a step um, the yeah, wrong way. Yeah, and his way. hand's not even outstretched, really. It mm. sort of looks like he's almost half leaving it. Yeah. Um, Comes off the post, comes back. What it's a, a great block. Brilliant piece of defending from Gabriel that is absolutely sensational. Really. How do you feel about the Cedric lying on the floor technique? Um just as I mean, an aside. It's, it's a new thing, isn't it? I mean when I've seen other I can't teams. Can't blame do him it. for not being able to watch. I felt exactly the same at that yeah, point. In yeah, time. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm guessing they're they're just trying to block the low shot under the wall. So the wall jumps, and to to make your wall bigger, um, you know, you have the guy at the bottom to block off any shot that's going to go underneath the wall. So, um, look, it looks a bit weird. We've seen it done a few times this season as well. Hector Bellerin has done it. I remember in one of the games, um, or a couple of the games, Hector Bellerin has been the guy behind the behind yeah. the wall so I just it's there to give your wall a bit more um, size mm. it's odd well, looking though. it is odd looking yeah and I and, uh, I, wonder, I guess Kane bends it around the wall I, I mm. can't quite tell from he the does same yeah, ball, yeah, yeah 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 I mean the ball comes out and Sanchez has a chance to redeem himself and it's just you know it, sometimes in a situation like that you know when Pepe had the shot against Burnley mm. again, that came off the bar, came off the guy's shoulder, and everyone was like, wow, you know, what a block, what a block. And I was like, yeah, but he was just sort of stood in the way. With Gabriel, mm. he gets his head on that. Yeah, yeah. Do, it's great you know defending. I mean? like, it's great defending. It's not going to hit him anyway. He moves to block it. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's really... Well, I mean, really yeah, the, the fact that he's there as well, you know, he, he's in the True, right he's position. recovered you know, that he's position. Got in, yeah. You know, he's not standing or ball watching or anything like that. So, you know, he's in the right area and it is just a, a great, great piece of, of defending. But, you know, in the fact that we've won this game and those last 10 minutes were as, as terrifying as they were, and I, I'll admit I was sort of close to about 99 point. Nine 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 mm. nine nine. We didn't want to see five come up on that board. That's oh, for sure. Oh my god! Um, you know there were some crosses and and we, we got couldn't to one, didn't he? We couldn't keep Deep the ball. Cross. Leno, if, why he decided when we had eleven versus ten, that was the time to start booting it long to nobody. <laughs> to I, El Nene. Oh yeah. my <laughs> god! It's like just we've got we've got the extra man. I realise that there's a lot of pressure and you're, you know, you're you're. You're hanging on in a way, uh, which sounds weird when you're playing uh, against ten men. But I, you know, I get it. You know, football matches have their their own momentum, and and it really swung too far in in Tottenham's way. Does that though? Now that we've won and we're discussing it the morning after, does that make you feel happier because you? can see that the Spurs fans that you're following had these glimmers of hope where they were like, if only, oh, if only, oh, and then it didn't come to pass and we still won. Does it make me happier? Uh, no, I don't think it makes me happier. I would have loved to have just seen it out serenely. Um, mm. But but I'm not overly concerned about it. You know, I liked how honest Mikel Arteta was about yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, he couldn't have been more honest. I think he said it was the worst 10 minutes we've ever played under him. Um, yeah. He might be right. I mean, it was a kind of diabolical lack of control. I don't know. I guess I just described that to a bit of fatigue. I mean, someone like Thomas Partey looked dead on his feet, I think, by that point in the he game. He did, yeah. Um, but I think as well, just, just nerves. You know, it was a big mm. result for Arsenal, a big day, and... They, you know, it, it got to them. Mm. I think Arteta maybe made a mistake in terms of not really having a centre forward, a focal point on the field. I do think that maybe handed them the initiative a bit. You know, I, I don't yeah. know if Aubameyang was a, a an option truly, uh, but if he was, I think that would have given Spurs more to worry about at the other end and prevented them coming onto us quite so easily. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think um, we should have had him on earlier. I think Lacazette was was. Uh, he faded a bit, as did Partey, you know. Um, yeah. So he we wasn't alone. We the initiative a bit. You That's know? a good and, way of putting it. But we still won, uh, so fuck them. Listen, I, I do think these North London derby games are generally mental. 
And I think it's very <laughs> difficult to analyse them objectively. And to be honest, <laughs> I'm not that interested in doing it. You know, it, we won, we won. Yeah. And that's all it's about for me. It's been a good week. All in all, it's yeah. been a good week. You know, we, we did have that... Um, that big win in in Greece and uh, against Olympiakos, and I know there was a, a sort of stain on the tablecloth, if you like, in terms of how we conceded the goal that we did. But we did score three away goals in Europe, and and when you were looking at at you know the week that was coming up, Olympiakos, then Spurs, then Olympiakos again, mm, you know, mm. I was hopeful, obviously, but not hugely confident that this was going to turn out quite as well as it did. So it's really great this morning to to sort of wake up and not feel uh, a sense of, oh, in the pit of your stomach. And instead, it's excitement and it's, it's enjoyment and there's schadenfreude and there's things to like about what we did and how we did it and, and encouraging things about the way that we played. And Tottenham lost and Mourinho is sad and Kane is sad and Lamella got sent off. You know, it's a, it's a cocktail of, of glee, if you like. That's not Absolutely. a cue for a song, by the way. <laughs> and Arteta breaks his Derby duck, I think, here. Yeah. I mean, he's beaten all of our other big rivals. Now he's got the first win over Spurs. Um, just a shame, as always with these games, not to have the fans there. Yeah. It would have been a really fun one. It really would have. It really would have. I mean, to... They would have really enjoyed seeing Jose Mourinho losing his shit on the touchline. I'm certain of that. But would you have had the chance, James, to take a selfie with Mourinho looking <laughs> distraught in the background if fans had been there? That's the other can, thing. Can I tell you what happened there? So yeah, yeah. I was um, basically at the end of the games, typically they they do all the post-match TV interviews. Um, you know, the managers, it's quite amazing, actually. They have sort of four, you know, little screens set up. They mm. do them in front of, and they just go one by one by one by one. They get asked the same questions by everybody, and they give slight variations on the same answer. Yeah. But it's quite fun to listen into those and see if some of those slight variations, um, you know, provide you with any insight. And Mourinho had reached end of his, and he was doing his last interview uh, with a couple of people. And as I walked by, I was just making my way out the stadium. I could hear him talking about the penalty and complaining about it. <laughs> and it just made me laugh and smile so much <laughs> that I thought I'm going to capture this moment for posterity. And I was really pleased because I posted it on Twitter and Instagram and a lot of people got in touch to say, you are wearing a mask, but it's very clear nonetheless how much you're smiling. You can see the, the light in my eyes. Smiling with your eyes, James. Yeah, yeah. I, listen... He is our mortal sworn enemy. Yeah. Um, and may it always remain the case. Yeah. People shouldn't overlook that. There's some great pictures doing the rounds as well. There's one with um, with Arteta, Arteta and Cedric. And, Cedric yeah. and, and it looks like they're kind of going, look at that cunt. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably not. I mean, they could be. I hope they are. But, um, you know, Mourinho kind of has this look on his face as well. Um, yeah, glorious uh, great fun like you say a shame we couldn't be there and hopefully we'll get back there soon um, because I think you know people and football fans and everyone needs to experience um, moments and games like that they mean uh, such a, a great deal to, to everyone you know so fingers crossed we can get there sooner rather than later yeah absolutely but I'm sure all the listeners enjoyed it mm. wherever they were watching and yeah I, I this is a really dislikable Tottenham team not just because of Mourinho we mentioned Kane there are a few other characters Lamella Joe Hart sat in front of me right Joe about Hart four seats. yeah he's he's their sub goalie oh um, yeah, yeah and he was about four seats in front of me and he kept shouting at Harry Kane come on H you can do it H it's coming H oh, it, never, it never did come never came and I was so pleased lovely and on that hilarious note we will <laughs> we will take a break and we're going to come back with your questions and more in part two right after this it's the history of the Tottenham it's, 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 it's the history of the Tottenham it's the history of the Tottenham they miss always something they, they concede many many chances every, every game many chances every, every game it's the history of the Tottenham. Tottenham, Tottenham. Tottenham. 
It's the history of the Tottenham. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. James, you've got to start there because mm. Mahir has a very important question. And he says, what do you think of Tottenham? Oh, shit. Hmm. What do you think of shit? Tottenham. Thank you. Do you know what, Andrew? That is quite all right. Another one from Chaos Attack Squirrel Team Lead, which is a great name. Um, he says, good morning, guys. I did a small experiment last night. I'd like you to verify the results. It appears for all intents and purposes that North London is red. Can you mm. please confirm thanks in advance? Hang on. Let me just have a look out the yep. window now. Live. Yeah. yeah, it's looking pretty red out there. I'll be honest with you, guys. Good stuff. Good stuff. Been painted red. Brilliant. That's all we needed to know. Delighted. Um, okay, let's have another question, shall we? Why not? Uh, I've, oh, let's start with this because we've had so many questions about it. So Queen Guna, who's at So Fire, has asked, how do we solve a problem like Martinelli? But then Kevin Singleton, in response to that question, has said, what is the obsession with Martinelli? He's been out injured and players have stepped up to the plate in his absence. Willian's playing better, Pepe too, Saka and Smith Rowe have been brilliant. So where does he fit in against players with form? He'll get his chance when form dips. Where do you sit on Gabby Martinelli, who missed out on this squad entirely? Yeah, that's a bit of a strange one that he wasn't even in the squad. But um, look... I think he's a really exciting, talented young player. I do wonder if it's more of a thing from the outside than it is on the inside. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw him celebrate one of the goals against Olympiacos the other night. I can't remember which one. Maybe it was El Neni's or I don't, I don't quite remember. Uh, it could have been Gabriel's, maybe the header, uh, fellow Brazilian, et cetera, et cetera. And he looked very happy that we'd scored, um, which sounds obvious. But, you know, he, he doesn't um, appear to be demonstrating any sign of, of discord or, or unhappiness or anything like that. You know, if you look at what we've got on the left-hand side with, with Emile Smith-Rowe and the kind of player he is and what he does in that position, yeah, that's not what Gabriel Martinelli does and that's not who he is. So, it, you know, it seems like you know, what we want to do on the left-hand side in particular games doesn't really suit him or the way that he plays. And we've talked before, haven't we, about what um, what his final position might be or where he might play, and it might well be centre-forward. That might mm. be the, the, the position that he plays. So to play there, he's got Aubameyang in front of him and he's got Lacazette in front of him, and for a while he had Enkedia in front of him as well. So my my feeling is that like while I want to see more of him and I think it's a little bit strange that he hasn't seen uh, too many minutes because he had a really positive impact when he came back from injury he did mm. have a positive impact I think you know um, it was really exciting to see him come back into the team and, and be effective so it is a little bit of a surprise but at the end of the day he is only 19 and we have spoken before haven't we about young players being eased into action um we used the Phil Foden example at Man City where everyone there, all their fans are screaming and screaming for him to be starting games. And, and you know, he didn't and was um, eased into action. And perhaps the benefits of that are, are uh, evident in what Phil Foden is doing now. So I'm not yeah. massively worried about the situation or anything like that at this moment in time. No, and there might be a physical component to it yeah. as well, you know, the, given the injury that he's come back from. I do think it is principally a tactical thing. That's what everyone seems to say around the club. And, you know, he's a bit unfortunate in that he play the areas he plays are really congested. I mean, it could be worse. It could be Reese Nelson playing with the under-23s. You know, there, there's clearly mm. a lot of options in that part of the pitch. Um, I mean... I just wanted to give a... Sh oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I wanted to give a shout out to this question from Geezy, at Geezy P from Ricky who said, yeah. I've come up with a mad theory that Martinelli <laughs> isn't playing because Madrid want him and he'll be part of a swap involving Odegaard and maybe Ceballos too. With that in mind, would you say an Odegaard type is more important to this team than a Martinelli? I just wanted to shout that out as like a top conspiracy madness theory. Based on uh, absolutely nothing. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. Who knows? He might be right. I, I certainly haven't heard anything to that effect. No, no, no. I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, uh, is an, it's a good question, though. Like, is an Odegaard type more important to this team than a Martinelli? And you might say at this moment, yes. You know? Um, yeah, I mean, I when think When we've the got Aubameyang who, and, you know. Yeah, I, I think the player who's sort of giving... Martinelli the most problems in a way is probably Nicola Pepe you know in that in the, what they contribute as as wingers as wide players in terms of goal threat mm. you know is kind of similar of a type and we're saying look Pepe's not getting enough minutes so it, it, I think it's it's just kind of circumstance to be honest with you I, I think you can look at the bench yesterday and say do we need Hector Bellerin Callum Chambers and Rob Holding you know, and Mohamed El Nene. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, there yeah, are yeah, enough yeah. players of a similar type that you think there'd be room, but maybe Arteta didn't really see a scenario in which he would need Martinelli on the field. Yeah, I mean, certainly you could make a good case. You know, if we were talking about bringing Aubameyang on, um, you know, Martinelli as somebody who could come on at centre True. forward might have been useful True. yesterday. So that would have been really useful. Yeah. So I don't quite know why he wasn't on the bench. I mean, obviously they weren't expecting four. Um, for uh, Aubameyang to be, to, yeah. to be late. Do you know, I mean, I don't know, if, um, are the non-involved players still required to be there on match days? Like everyone was fit yesterday. So, you know, the likes of Reese Nelson, Gabriel Martinelli, etc., who weren't in yeah. the squad, are they there? I don't believe not? so. Right. I believe as a rule, there's one surplus player. Um, certainly when they travel to away games, mm. they take a surplus player in case somebody is ill or has to drop out through injury at the last minute. I don't know if they do that at home because maybe it'd be easier to call somebody up mm. if required. They might not need to be present. So, no, I think for COVID reasons, it's not like everybody's around. Um, you know, ordinarily during the season, they'd all be sat there, you know, behind the behind the subs bench a lot of the time. Um but I don't think that is the case at the moment. Hmm. Okay. So I guess Martinelli was probably watching it from the sofa like the rest of us. Right. On the Discord, um, Metofferson says, Smith Rowe looked really good yesterday on the left. Should that be a serious option for us going forward? I think having two creators on the pitch just makes us more potent in attack. And Chris Michael on Twitter, who's at CMike1970, says, after Emil Smith Rowe's performance yesterday, do you think he should be first choice on the left of midfield if we sign Odegaard Perl? Permanently, could we have a Perez-esque player on our hands? The contrast when Willian came on for him was extreme. Um, and I think we talked earlier about how, you know, why those last 10 minutes were, were as poor as they were. I don't think it was necessarily just because uh, Willian came on, although I don't think it, it particularly helped. Um, so, yeah, let's talk Smith Rowe first, and then I've got a question about Odegaard. Well, Smith Rowe, I think, has qualities that mean he absolutely can play in wide areas. He's got a sprint for a start. You know, you don't mm. get... If you think of your sort of classic number 10, even the ones who are still playing in the Premier League, people like James Madison, they're not really sprinters like Bruno Fernandes in the traditional sense. Smith Rowe does have that over 5, 10 yards. We saw it, I think, in the build-up to the, that shot, Lacazette, when he when he stepped over it, when he should have hit it. Smith Rowe just absolutely roasted his full back there. Mm. And uh, I think he can do that. He's willing to run in behind makes good diagonal runs, can drop into the centre. I mean, look at the position he takes the shot on from which he hits the woodwork in the first half. Very, very central position. Um, there is a kind of natural... If you think of our formation as it kind of gets laid out at kickoff on the mm. TV graphics, there's kind of a natural pull over towards the right flank because Odegaard wants to go out and play there generally a lot of the time and Smith Rowe can come inside a little bit and create an overlap for Tierney so I think it really suits him and Arsenal have got a great history of some really talented you know theoretically central playmakers who've made very very good careers yeah. on the wing uh, you'd have to think of yeah Perez is a great shout but there have also been people like Andrea Chavin, Thomas Rosicki, Sam Nasri, Freddie Jumberg as well. Freddie Jumberg, yeah, they've all played player. from wide areas and fared really, really well. I mean, Freddie himself, I didn't see the TV coverage, was apparently a little bit, not critical, but sort of queried the decision to sign Odegaard, given that Arsenal have Smith Rowe, because he really sees Smith Rowe as a central player. I just think he's so versatile. 
Um, and, and it's about ca- how do we get more good creative players into the team? I, and I, this is a way. Yeah, I, and I think what's really exciting me about Smith Rowe, you mentioned the word versatile. I'm not sure, it's not that I d- disagree with it, um, but I think maybe I am agreeing with it, but I just think that you can put him into a number of positions. Perhaps that's the very definition of it. I don't know what's happened to my brain. He's kind of multifunctional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he he combines with everyone. Like he's not just, you know, you could put him anywhere and he will work, if that makes sense. He's like, uh, he's like, um, you know, one of those adapters you buy when you go on holidays. He's like a plug exactly. that you can universal use in Spain. Adapter. Yeah, a universal exactly. adapter. And, <laughs> and that's why he is a great number 10, by the way, because when he plays in that position, mm. he can kind of interconnect with everybody on the field. I mean, I think there was a game, I think it was the West Brom game. He exchanged a pass with every outfield player and he does have that capacity mm. to kind of fill in the gaps. He's quite amorphous in the way he plays positionally. Um but there is something Odegaard brings. I know you've got a question about him that mm. is different and that is worth inclusion. And if you want both in the team, I think this is how you do it. Yeah. I mean, look, for all the panic of the last um, 10 minutes or so, yeah, and there was panic, I think one of the things that stood out to me yesterday from a player perspective was was Smith Rowe and it was Odegaard. But I had a look at their stats and I had a look at their passing stats. And Odegaard wow, was yeah. 96.6%, 97%. Smith Rowe, 97.3%. Um, yeah, you the know, on the field, yeah. Um, to, to, to have players who, who, who give you that security in the opposition half and in your own half as well, but primarily that's where they operate, helps you control games. You know, mm. we've missed that, um, I think, throughout this season. I mean, shout to Granite Shack as well. More passes than anybody else, uh, and also at 90, 94.3%. So I thought Shack had a very solid game, you know. Um, yeah. He sort of made up for, not made up for, but, you know, he he reacted well to, to what happened in the last game. That's but, what he but, does. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, what he does. does. He makes a mistake and he reacts well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Odegaard and, and Smith Rowe, I think they're they're complementary, you know. I think we had a question about that. Um, see if I can find it here. Um, I think they are too. Yeah, Sean Adams, uh, who's at Sean Adams 13, said, was yesterday proof that Smith Rowe and Odegaard are not alternative number 10s, but are best used in tandem to create dangerous partnerships on both sides of the field at the same time. And I think there's something to that. You know, they, they, they can work together. Yeah, and I think we've seen a bit of an uptick in terms of the, our performances at right back, whoever it's been, whether it's been Cedric or mm. Bellerin. And I think Odegaard's part of that because I think he creates some nice partnerships, some nice triangles and options on that side. Um, you know, I, I think both can play centrally and, you know, sometimes you will want to rotate them. But after seeing them together yesterday, I mm. think it's a really exciting prospects and I think they are complementary because I think fundamentally they have different attributes yeah. you know there are things they share but there are things Smith Rowe does that sprint being one of them that Odegaard doesn't seem to be able to do but things technically Odegaard can do that are really mm. sublime and Arteta spoke yesterday about the defensive shift that Odegaard put in and I think maybe that's something that hasn't attracted as much attention but he has worked exceptionally hard one- since he arrived was it in the was it in the, the the terrifying ten minutes or was it earlier in the game where he got back into the box? Um, yeah. Oh, it could have been earlier in the game. Actually, I'm just going through. Maybe uh, I mean when, when yeah, it was the early been, early in the on. second half. Sorry, apologies. Early in the second half, where Spurs had a little bit of possession early on, and there was a there was a moment where he got back from uh, quite deep to defend in our box. It was a very important mm. piece of defending. So yeah, you're right to point that out. Yeah, I was just going to say when Aubameyang has been playing, Odegaard has almost been you know he when we've been pressing or defending, Aubameyang's dropped left off, and then Odegaard's been defending from the front. Um, yeah, he's mm. made a really big contribution. I mean, for a loan signing in January, uh, it's been a really good piece of business so far. All right, so let's talk about him a little bit. Uh, uh, on the Discord, Boonana, 
what's my name, uh, says, uh, really surprised, uh, happy with Odegaard about how he went about his pressing duties, uh, applying pressure all the way to the end of the match. Can we see him actively commanding, leading the press, coupled with his technical ability? What a player we have on our hands could be a real bargain. Should we sign him on a permanent basis? And if so, what would be the right price and what would be too expensive? And Mark G says, uh, Odegaard is starting to show what a talented player he is. And I think most Arsenal fans would like to keep him. A lot depends on the player himself and whether he wants to make the move permanent. Do you think the lack of fans in the stadium will work for us or against us in that regard? I can see it from both sides. In terms of helping us keep him? Yeah. Well, we might have 10,000 fans for the last couple of games. So a huge onus on those guys who desperately plead with Martin Odegaard. Um, I don't know. I I hope we can keep him. I really do. Mm. Um, I, I, yeah, know, yeah. What gives me hope is the fact that Madrid are potentially, you know, on the precipice of a rebuild. Um, you know, it looks like they're going to come second, certainly to their local rivals, Atletico Madrid in La Liga. And, you know, there's a big turnover required there. Now, obviously, if you're looking to rebuild a 22 year old playmaker with international pedigree, captain of his country now. Yeah, recently made captain of Norway. I mean, <laughs> you'd think that he'd be part of that. But if they decide they need to raise funds, yeah, equally, he is an ob- <clears throat> pardon me, he's an obvious choice to sell, given that he's not been part of things there really this season. It is a weird one, isn't it? Because the better he plays, the more we want to keep him. The better he plays, the more expensive <laughs> yeah. he is going to be if Real Madrid are willing to to let him go, and if he is, and there is no to join agreement us. on a fee. No, so that is the position we're in. I have to say, he's got to be enjoying it, right? Yeah. I mean, think about what what kind of a reception he would have got yesterday at the final whistle, you know, to score in a North London derby and to be part of a winning team in in your first Mm. derby and to play so well, you know, that would not have been lost on, on the Emirates crowd, you know? So that is something that is, it's missing. I, I wonder are players able to you know, compartmentalise that and realise that, you know, as much as we're uh, missing being there as fans, they must be missing fans as well for of course. for what they bring to their own enjoyment of a game. You know, winning the game obviously is is what they're out to do, but there's got to be something missing for, for them as well. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do wonder how he can feel the love from the fans, Um it could be a factor. Well, if I know anything about the Arsenal fans, it's that they've got a very active online community. Really? And I'm, I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'm sure people are letting him know that he's appreciated. Um, whether or not that has quite the same emotional impact, I don't know. But uh, it's not easy to find players mm. like him, I no. don't think. Uh, you know, and I, I, I don't know what kind of spending power Arsenal will have this summer if any, but he would be a very good start. A very, very good start. Yeah. Somehow get a deal done there. I would like, I would like us to do it. I hope we can do it. It it might require some, I don't know, another loan from creative accounting. Yeah. Buy some Bitcoin, stand by Bitcoin or something. And, you know, oh no, it destroys the planet, doesn't it? Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't know. And I have no idea what the kind of ballpark figure Mm would be but if it's between you know if there's a player we can buy from Madrid that we've currently got on loan for me it's certainly him yes he, he's the one I not, want. not the other one no the other one's not a bad player no I just um, don't think he's as good as Odegaard or as valuable to what we I don't think we need want. him as much yeah. and I don't think it's I think it's easier to find someone who could do a similar job I think Odegaard mm. has a real quality to the way he sees the game and the pass that he's able to make. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, I suppose um, one player who might be able to do what Danny Ceballos has done uh, is Joe Willock, you know, who's having a good loan spell, isn't he, at, at Newcastle so far? They he's seem to a like really him. good yeah. loan spell, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's just because he's playing in the right sort of team at the right sort of level for him. Maybe. Um but where uh, are Newcastle in the table? Uh, probably above us. Most people are, aren't they? <laughs> I, but I, I think um, 
he's having a, certainly a really interesting period and he seems to be developing they love him up there they absolutely love it I mean they'll be as desperate to keep him as we are to keep Martin Odegaard yeah so, so yeah, yeah two, interesting. two Premier League assists this season for Danny Ceballos that's it 30 mm-hmm. appearances in all competitions two assists so you know I don't think we'd be losing a huge amount if he were to go back to to Real Madrid no, I think I personally think we we would need somebody. You know, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. To... No, I don't disagree. I think a midfielder has got to be on the list this yeah. summer. But like you say, if if there's money to go uh, to Real Madrid, it's it's got to be for Odegaard for me. And if, listen, if they want to do two for the price of one, I'm open to it. <laughs> if they get desperate, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I'll challenging take times. Advantage. Yeah, challenging financial times. For not just us, but everyone. So there might be some odd deals. You never know. You never know. Uh, What about this question from the Discord? KT, where do you think we are in our progression back to the top compared to Spurs? Personally, I'm convinced that we are comfortably a better team than them, despite the table. And this was confirmed by our dominance yesterday. And then with our comparative run-ins at St. Tottenham's Day in a season where Arsenal fell out the big six and Spurs were title contenders would be the sweetest of all. I, I struggle with this kind of question because I could not give a fuck about Tottenham and their right. progression or where they are or what they're doing. And, you know, I wasn't particularly impressed with them, but Mourinho's a very um, experienced manager. Um yeah, I mean, the idea that people were talking them up as title contenders earlier in the season is just ridiculous, obviously, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because we all know of the, the history of the Tottenham. So, you know, it's like people haven't paid any attention. I'm just more concerned about who we are and what we're doing. And I know you can... There is... When we're better uh, than they are... It's nice to say that and everything else, but I think we just need to focus on on what we're trying to do and not worry about them too much. If you know what I mean, does that make sense? Like I, th- I, yeah, I yeah. just, I just prefer to see what we're doing and how we can continue to make some progress and how we can win more games and get back to where we need to get to without holding us up against Tottenham. Um, because I think if we can do what we want to do then that will be a natural consequence of it. I mean, being better than them and, and finishing higher than them will be a natural consequence of us making the kind of progress that we want to make. Absolutely. And I think, I do think when you look at our kind of key players, our best players, there are some really mm. young players in there who are improving all the time. I mean, look at Smith Rowe, the way in which he's blossoming. We've eulogised about Bakaya Saka plenty of times on this podcast um, when you look at Spurs I think you know names like Alderweire Loris Bale Kane they are on the downward slope probably in terms of their trajectory mm. and so I'm full of optimism that if we even if we don't get a St. Totterham's Day this year we can't be far away. I agree with the question that I think we we were the better side yesterday and we are the better side at this point in time. Um, any chance that we manage it this season, getting above them? I don't know. Four what, there's points. four points in it? Look, nothing four is impossible. Points, ten games. Yeah, nothing is impossible. We've, we've come back from uh, further than that. If you remember, there was one year, wasn't there, we were 11 or 13 points behind them mm-hmm. with... I can't remember how many games left, maybe 10 games, maybe a few more games than that. But um, that was the whole negative spiral thing. And we came back to finish in the top four. So look, as I keep saying, game by game by game by game for what's left of this season. You know, there's no... Look, they've got to go to Man City. Mm. Uh, Oh, that's their final, actually. Apologies. No, they've got to go to Leicester. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I I would love it. But yeah, game Mm. by game. Let's just get the points on the game board. by game by game, and then see where we are, and if we can, you know, continue to make progress, um, all well and good. Um, from the Discord, Duran says, "Hi, gents, great win! Uh, ecstatic to beat Mourinho." Um, 
But he said when Partey misdirected a pass, we talked about this a little bit earlier, leading to a corner for uh, Spurs, Luis yeah. started shouting at Partey, which led to another mistake and a giveaway to a Spurs player, leading to further shouting from members of the team. I understand that at the professional level and during high-stakes Premier League games, there's no time for mercy and forgiveness. The fiery emotions can't be contained, but every player is motivated differently, and it seems that all this shouting at Partey only worsened his confidence for the rest of the match. What are your thoughts? I don't think the shouting had as much impact on Partey's performance as the physical aspect. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, I actually came out of yesterday's game with a sort of... I was probably a bit unfair on Thomas Partey because I sort of came out of the game thinking, I don't think he played very well there. I think that my opinion was sort of coloured by the last 20 minutes. I think he was actually pretty mm. good up until that point. Yep. And then I think he, he just sort of ran out of steam. Um, the shouting thing is interesting because... We can look at it and go, well, that's a sign of panic or anxiety. Um, But then if Arsenal were quiet in that period and people like Luis and Shaka weren't stepping up... Where's the leadership? Exactly. You know, and we'd be saying, you just need somebody to take charge and show a bit of direction and show a bit of leadership. So it's it's a difficult one. I think ultimately, you know, the shouting, the pointing, the remonstrating is ultimately a bit of a sideshow. I think it's about what you do and can you play, you know, sometimes leadership is about can you play with a sense of calm? Can you play, can you be in control in tense moments? Um, And we didn't really manage that yesterday. Yeah, I really just don't have any issue whatsoever with players, unless it like, uh, who was the, uh, was it Lee Bowyer and Kieran Dyer? Had a yeah, fight on the pitch. Are. I mean, you don't want that. I mean, you do want it when it's the opposition. You want to see that all the time. You want to Bender see. Bender and Adebayo, didn't they? Have yeah, they did. Yeah, that was during the the Birmingham game. So, but in general, I don't have any problem with players arguing or or whatever on the pitch. You know, it's just part and parcel of football. Talking and sometimes the talking gets a bit intense, or there's a need to sort of you know. Um, get somebody's head right. Like, you know, it, it can be a positive thing being shouted at or being a shouter. You know, you're you're telling people to, to just book their ideas up. It, it happens at every level of football all the time. Uh, and I don't think a professional player like Thomas Partey is going to go, oh my God, David Luiz shouted at me. I feel... He played for Diego so- Simeone. Do you know what I mean? I think <laughs> surely he's been shouted at yeah. a few times. And I think you're right. It's the physical aspect of his game uh, which which let him down. I don't think it was the being shouted at that, that led to the mistakes. I think there's a fatigue there. He's not quite ready to do the 90 minutes. Uh, maybe that 90 minutes will do him good, you know, in terms of um, making him, uh, you know, better in the final stages of games. He hasn't played 90 minutes for us very often, and he's had some physical issues throughout this season. So, you know, that was an intense game yesterday as well. Uh, and, before that, I thought he was very good, uh, made some excellent passes, made some tackles, um, took some shots. I mean, I think he needs to to work on his shooting. That would be. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because, you know, he scored some good goals for for Ghana. It's, I feel like it's becoming the David Luiz of free, like with his free kicks. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. He did it for Brazil once, but yeah. I, I like his willingness to take the shot on. I think that adds mm. something. Um, but I did think of you yesterday, actually, when the couple went. <laughs> Very far wide. Um, Here's a question from Mark Morrow. No relation to Steve, as far as I'm aware. In Rugby Union, the England coach has finishers. This involves leaving some of his best players on the bench to come on and finish the game when the opposition are tired. Is it possible that Arteta sees Pepe as our finisher? Um, I don't... Don't know if that concept necessarily applies um, to football because it's a much lower scoring sport than rugby. And uh, less substitutions. Mm. So no, I don't 
I don't think so. I just think he's been a little bit unlucky to be left out of the team. You know, Saka's form on the right-hand side has caused him a problem, and Emile Smith-Rowe doing what he does on the left-hand side, again, slightly differently to, you know, what you get if you played Pepe on the left. You get something different than what you get for, for Smith-Rowe, and that seems to be what Arteta likes at this moment in time, and I do wonder if the combination with, with Tierney over there as well is is part of it. So, no, I don't think he's a finisher, and I'm not sure you can really apply that concept to um, to football, although I do think you can use your substitutions more effectively than we have, but that's that's a wider issue, isn't it, you know? Yeah, I mean, Pepe is the kind of guy, as a defender, you don't want to see coming on when you're feeling a bit tired. He's a nightmare yeah. to face, but I think he's shown he can do it early in games as well. Um, you know, certainly the Leicester game, he looked at it mm. right from the first whistle. So, I am I mean, listen, I feel like I say this every week. I'm optimistic there'll be game time for him in the next seven days. He'd surely, you'd think he's got a good chance. Of I think he'll start on, on Thursday. I think he'll start yeah. on Thursday. Yeah, I do too. Um, here is a question from Ashley Moss, who's at Ashley Moss 4. He says, Morning, guys. I thought Tierney was outstanding yesterday. Should we already be considering giving him a new contract? If he keeps playing like this, surely people will start taking notice of him. So giving him the new deal now makes sense. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. I think if you look at you know, the, the expectations when he arrived, they were good, but I don't think anybody thought he'd be quite as good as he has been. Mm. I think he's clearly one of the most important players. Also, he's the right kind of age. You yeah. Know, he's the kind of age, early 20s, that we want to build around who could be part of this team for the next five years yeah, and beyond. Exactly. Those are the He'd be the at the contracts. top of my list. Yeah. You know? Me too. Me too. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Yeah. Do it. I think it's him. You know, Smith Rowe mm-hmm. is a contract conversation that needs to happen. Um, I think there's a case for Bern Leno as well. But, um, yeah, Tierney, I, I, I would absolutely pay him whatever he wants. And I think it's right to say he'll be looked at. I don't think that just because he's, you know, Scottish and he came out from Celtic, I don't think we've got any divine right to him. I think... Uh, clubs will be looking at him. For sure. But I do think this is the kind of club at which he could um, be very happy, if you like, for a, a long period of time. Well, again, do you know what I mean? how fans would react. I think how fans would react to his performances, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was adored in Glasgow and he would be here in full stadiums. And it's a shame he's not getting that reception week in week out he'd have a song by now wouldn't he does he have a song he doesn't not one that springs to mind do you know that was actually the moment I felt the absence of the fans most plainly it was when Emma Smith Rowe was substituted and you were like this is a standing ovation moment yeah 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 Yeah. it should be like a kind of coronation of like hey you're not a kid you played today in the derby or probably you know maybe Arsenal's best player yeah um he really, really deserved that ovation. They should have piped one in. <laughs> Fake they? standing ovations, or <laughs> maybe they could get you know those uh, those wobbly standy up things that, that with the wavy arms, you know, yeah, the car, yeah, yeah. that they have at used car dealerships, inflatable. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just have one of those on the uh, on the other side of a of a stadium, and as and when players who play well are taken off, push the button, and it gives the fake crowd noise, and those guys all stand up. That'd be. Good. I'd like that. Yeah. I'd like that. Um, um, did you ask me that question? I think you did. I did about tyranny, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just having a look to see if I've got another good one here. If you've got one to ask me it while I have a look. Okay. Uh, Beardy McBeardface, who's that Bearded Hannon, says, what would it take for Harry Kane to get sent off? I don't know. To kill a man? No, I don't think so. That's That's not enough. Not he wouldn't, it wouldn't get a replay. If he slew a centre half with a sword, they wouldn't show it on match of the day too. No, I mean he'd have to. It depends on the sword. I'd say if he had maybe a cutlass, well, that, you know, okay. not just a regular old sword, because you know. Pff, but if he, he had would a have a cutlass, because he's an old-fashioned sort of guy, isn't he, Harry? Kane? H, H, H. He's coming. H. Just slice his head off. H. <laughs> The voice in his head that makes him do all these things is actually Joe Hart. That's what we'll discover. Mm. 
So yeah, so you think it will be? I mean, what what about if he took to the field with a hockey mask and a chainsaw? Mm. And I think it would go to a VAR appeal. What if he cut the VAR referee in half? He'd be held as a national hero, presumably, and quite rightly so in that instance. But (laughs) I, I honestly can't imagine. I mean, as far as I can, he sort of goes around the football pitch like Wiley Coyote, sort of setting these dastardly traps for people to fall and break their neck. Yeah. And seemingly without repercussion. I think there'll be a Netflix documentary about it one day. Like, how did this man get away with trying to kill people on a football pitch? <laughs> that would be a good one, all right. Yeah. It, it is It is. It is weird. I have, I've kind of accepted it at this stage. I mean... It ain't going to change. I'm just looking on my Twitter. It says Harry Kane is trending. So, uh, okay. I'm looking at, okay. Watch Harry Kane's brutal challenge on Gabriel as Arsenal fans question why VAR didn't send Spurs star off in Derby. That's from The Sun, so I ain't clicking that shit. Um, Let's see. There's just a lot of clips of Harry Kane clattering into Gabriel. That's why he's yeah. trending. Well, quite right too. I mean, Former the thing is- Premier League referee Dermot Gallagher does not believe Harry Kane should have been sent off for Tottenham after his challenge on Arsenal's Gabriel. Gallagher says mm. the England captain did not take to the field with a sharpened cutlass. Therefore, no red card offence took place. <laughs> So, look, you've got it straight from the... Uh, well, there you go. The horse's mouth. Yeah. Um, this was quite a, uh, it's a strange question. Petrucci Koig says... Come on, you gunners. Says, do we need a left-footed centre-forward option? The plethora of pullback chances we create on the left sometimes feel wasted as the sharp angled shot on their weak foot is far from Ober or Lacquer's bread and butter. While having deeper lying left-footed runners like Odegaard and Pepe is great, Martin is perhaps set to leave soon and Pepe is a variable asset on the right. Who's, so do we need a left-footed centre-forward? Who's set to leave soon? Odegaard. Is that well, yeah. I think he means presumably if he goes back. Ah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I mean... I just think you need a good striker. You you don't necessarily have to have a left-footed um, option, just someone who can no. kick with their left foot, which, you know, a professional player should be able to do. You know, Bamiang has scored some good goals with his left foot, hasn't he? Think about the FA Cup final. So, yeah, I can see, True. but I I don't think you you specifically target a striker because of his foot. You target him because of how good he is. And if he happens to be left-footed, then great. And if not, don't worry about it. So I I don't know that you build your squad in the same way. I I think it's perhaps slightly different from the um, when you talk about defenders. Because quite obviously, we've gone out of our way to bring in a couple of left-footed central defenders. Um, But that has more of an impact on the way you can play from the back. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and I think part of Mikhail Teta's reliance on Granit Xhaka is probably to do with the fact that he plays from that side mm. and he gives you a build-up option. Um, do we need a left-footed striker? I don't think we do. I think in Saka and Pepe and Odegaard, you know, we have left-footed players who are capable of arriving in the box. Pepe, when he plays from the right, does that very well. You know, kind of arrives around the six-yard box or penalty spot from a pullback from the left. Um <laughs> It's where he missed the very good chance against Burnley. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, on the pitch yesterday, we had Saka, Odegaard, mm-hmm. Shaka, Tierney, Gabriel. Gabriel, all left footers. Is that a lot yeah. of left footers by any standards? Interesting question. I think by standards of previous Arsenal teams, I would say it is. Mm. I'd have to sort of look into it um, at Premier League level and say... You know, it feels very athletic, this, doesn't it? It does. We counted how many left-footed players are in every team ever. But yeah, no, I mean, there is a lot of balance. And one of the things, you know, I think that's sort of become maybe clear about 
the way Arteta wants to set this team up going forward. I think he likes having a left footer on the right. I think he likes having mm. a right footer on the left. I think he, he likes the natural kind of underlap and overlap that creates with the full back outside them. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll see what we do yeah. in the summer in terms of uh, who we bring in and what foot they kick with. Bring back Giroud is what we're saying, right? <laughs> Uh, let's not. Let's not okay. go there. Okay, look, I think we better leave it there for this one, no? Because um, I'm yeah. sure people will be wanting to listen to the podcast. So if you've got this far, thank you very much indeed. Hope you enjoyed the win yesterday as much as we did. Hope you enjoyed all the tears and all the saltiness and all the miserableness of everybody who is associated with Tottenham, from players to staff and fans who James know uh, knows personally pretty much <laughs> all of them, uh, it seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just taking the temperature. I just, you know, no, good, good. I hop in the you're, water. You're doing us a service. What can I say? Exactly. You, you don't want to be engaged. No, in no, no, I don't. I'm glad that you are out there, you know, putting yourself uh, in those people. kind of areas, those online spaces, etc. Well, you know, I take a lot of risks for you guys. I'm very brave. Well, we, we love you for it. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, to everyone listening, look, thanks a million as always. We will have a preview pod for Patreon members for the Olympiacos game. We'll do that for you on Wednesday. Uh, and we'll have uh, more uh, regular Arscast goodness for you on Friday uh, as well um, after the Olympiacos game. And hopefully we can continue on this uh, nice little run of form that we're on. So until the next one, take it easy. Bye-bye. <laughs>